Scripture presents numerous examples of the father-son relationship, a divine pattern that affects every aspect of life. The pattern is seen throughout the Bible. There is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. The father-son pattern begins with the Father, who is the source of all things. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. He is the Father, the only true God. Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father. The Father who alone hath immortality. The pattern continues through the Son, who is the channel of all the Father gives him. The Father has life in himself and he has given to the Son to have life in himself, the same immortal, eternal, everlasting life. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The Father raises up the dead and quickens, gives life to them. He is the original source of all life, and because he has given this original life to his Son, Jesus can raise the dead and give life to whomever he will. It is the voice of the Son of God that will raise the dead to life immortal. Not only immortal life, but the Father gives his Son all things. All things are delivered into my hands, Jesus said. For the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. God has given him a name that is above every name. All power, authority, is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Jesus said. God, even the Father, hath put all things under his feet. As the Son of the Father, he is appointed heir of all things. He is the channel by whom and through whom all things from the Father flow to his creation. The of whom gives to the by whom who gives life to us, his children. This is the pattern of life from the beginning. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, said to his Son, Let us make man, mankind, Adam in the Hebrew. Then the Son made man after their image. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them. In the image of God he made man. Men have been made in the likeness of God. At the beginning he made them male and female. Adam was first formed, and Adam was at first alone. Then as God had named all things in heaven, he appointed Adam the task of naming everything on earth. But then God said, it is not good that man should be alone. So woman came forth out of man as part of his very own body. And the Lord God took one of Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh and made a woman and brought her to the man. Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man and they shall be one flesh. Eve was formed, fashioned and made in Adam's likeness. Adam was the source of whom Eve came forth, was brought forth. The woman, Paul said, is from the man. Adam, the only human not begotten, Eve, the only human begotten from another human's side. She was not created from nothing, but was taken out of Adam's side, his bosom. She existed essentially in Adam, a part of him, before she was taken out. She became the express image of Adam. So also the Word is the unique Son of God, begotten of the Father, taken from his bosom, his side. And Adam named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Adam was the source, Eve was the channel, by whom, through whom, Adam became the father of our race. Eve was the same substance as Adam. They were both equal in nature. She was just as human as he was. But Eve was begotten in a different manner than all other human births. So too the Son of God was begotten of his Father. They both have the same divine substance, 
both equal in nature. Christ is just as divine as his Father. But the Son was begotten in a different manner, in eternity, than he was later born of Mary in time. Adam and Eve were essentially the same age. Both appear on day six. Father and Son are essentially of the same age. Both are from eternity. As Adam begat Eve, the Father begat Christ, and Christ begets us, giving us his spirit as Adam gave his rib. We are part of Christ. We partake of his divine nature. We are born again, Christ in us. We have his character. As Adam and Eve were one flesh, so also the Father and the Son are one spirit. The divine pattern is also seen in the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is the pattern of visible and invisible. The Son is the visible image of the invisible God. God, the only potentate, sovereign ruler, is the Father whom no man has seen nor can see. Philip said, show us the Father. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. No man has seen God at any time. The Father dwells in light unapproachable. No man comes to the Father but by the Son. God is the Father of lights, but the Son is the light of the world. He is the brightness, brilliance, radiance of the Father's glory, the express image of his Father's person. The Greek word is character, impress, stamp, exact reproduction. Genesis 15 describes a smoking furnace, light enshrouded, and a burning lamp, light revealed or manifested, appeared to confirm the covenant once again to Abraham. This is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He is the image of God. The Mosaic Sanctuary and its priesthood was the image of the invisible heavenly sanctuary and our High Priest. This principle is seen in both the written word and in the living word. For example, the expansion, amplification and magnification of the Father's word when expressed by the Son. The Father gives his word to his Son and the Son magnifies it. The signature of the Son's magnification of the Father's word was his style of repetition. Verily, verily, I say unto you, repeating words and names is a distinct character trait of the Son. Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, Jacob, Samuel, Samuel, Martha, Martha, Simon, Simon, Saul, Saul, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The Son is the Word of God. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. I will raise up a prophet like unto you. I will put my words in his mouth. God has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. He speaks for his Father. The Gospel of John especially features the word of the Father. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God. The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. I have given unto them the words that you, Father, have given me. The Father has given me commandment what I should say and what I should speak. But it is the opening words of John that are the most famous. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It is this last phrase which captures our attention and our curiosity. If the Word was God, how could the Word be with God? The literal reading is Kai Theos Hen Ho Logos, and God was the Word. The previous phrase, Pros Ton Theon, is literally with the God. John speaks the same way in his first epistle. That which was from the beginning, the Word of life, that eternal life which was with the Father, Pros Ton Patera. The difference is the definite article, the distinguishing between identity and quality. The Word, God's Son, was with the Father, identifying the Father as the God, the true God of whom are all things, 
Notice, John did not say the God was the Word. We can get a sense of the difference if we use the same grammatical structure but with different subjects. In the beginning was the woman, and the woman was with the human. This is a true statement, and we would understand that the human here is Adam. And human was the woman. This too is logical and true. Adam is his name, but human is what he and Eve are. We easily understand this to mean that the woman, Eve, was human in nature, but she was not the man in identity. Eve was not Adam. They were two separate persons, two individual identities. The same divine nature is possessed by both the Father and the Son. And we now know the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Let's return to the Greek reading once more with this new perspective in mind. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Deity, and the Word was Deity. The Word, the Son, was with the Supreme Deity, the Father, and the Word was Deity in nature, divine in nature. But the Son was not the Deity, the Son was not the Father, yet the Son has the Father's divine nature by inheritance. The Word has the same God quality, the same divine nature, the same Theos, the same Godness as His Father. Theos was the Word, and obviously so was God the Father. Both are divine, eternal deity. The Bible is composed of two testaments, the Old and the New. The Old Testament is the source of whom the New Testament quotes and applies and magnifies. The New Testament is the channel by whom we more fully understand the Old. And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded unto them the things concerning himself. In the Old Testament, we have the book of the law and the law of God, two laws. In the New Testament, we have the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Not a new law, but an amplification of the old, the original. The Son came to magnify the law, His Father's commandments, and to make it honourable. Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfil it, to fill it full. Not to replace, but to magnify the law. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. However, but is a supplied word. The KJV indicates this by italicising it. The law came by Moses, who received it from the Lord ordained in the hands of a mediator, the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And grace and truth came by Jesus, who not only spoke his Father's law to Moses on the mount, but amplified it in his sermon on the mount, as he said, You have heard it said of old, but I say unto you, He took the ministration of condemnation which was glorious, and made it much more glorious. In the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments are hidden inside. It was invisible, not seen by any man. But in the side of the Ark, the Book of the Law was accessible, could be taken out and read, and was an expansion of the Ten. As the Spirit of the Father dwells in His Son, so also the Ten Commandments are also written in the Book of the Law. As the book of the law sits at the side of the Ten Commandments, so the Son sits at the side of His Father. They are not interchangeable. One is source, the other is channel. Expression, amplifying and magnifying the words of the other. And in the very heart of the law are two commandments, the only two that are positive commands, that show the divine pattern of source and channel. The fourth commandment calls us to worship the Lord who made all that in them is, the source of whom are all things. The fifth calls us to honour our parents, the channel by which we received their life. Source and channel, origin and expression, is also illustrated by the branch. God said, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. He is the branch of the Lord, a righteous branch, a branch of righteousness. His name shall be called the Lord our righteousness. The Lord of hosts said to Joshua the high priest, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. 
The branch is used in scripture to denote royal descent. The king is the root, the princes are the branches. The man whose name is the branch shall grow up out of his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. The branch of the Lord is the servant of the Lord. He is righteous, he is a man, he is a priest and a king. He will build the Lord's temple, bear the Lord's glory and sit on the Lord's throne and have a council of peace between the branch and the Lord from whom he branched. A vine whose branches turned toward him and the roots thereof were under him. If the root be holy, so are the branches because the root and the branches have the very same nature. The Father is holy, he is the root. Holy Father, Jesus prayed, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus, the branch, is also holy. He is called the Holy One of God, thy Holy One who did not see corruption. The branch has the same nature, the same substance, the same qualities as the root. The branch is the offspring of the parent stock. The root is the source, the branch is the expression, the channel from which come more branches. Jesus is the true vine. We are his branches. We also are to partake of his divine nature. The divine pattern of source and expression is also illustrated by the stone. Behold the stone which I have laid before Joshua the high priest. Where does the stone come from? O great mountain before Zerubbabel the governor, and he shall bring forth a headstone. Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governor are symbolized by the stone and the great mountain. The stone laid before Joshua has seven eyes. The Lamb of God standing before his Father's throne in Revelation chapter 5 is also seen to have seven eyes. Of course, the Son of God is not only the Lamb of God, but also the stone that the builders rejected. The Lord God lays in Zion a stone, a precious corner stone, a living stone, head of the corner. The stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. The stone is just as old as the mountain. The stone has the same substance, the same nature, the same character. It's just as hard, just as enduring as the mountain because it came out of the mountain. So we see in all these examples the divine pattern of source and channel reflecting the Father-Son relationship.